goddammit. Well, hello there. I'm writer Mark Wooden, sci-fi wire fan creator and author of the Shadow Dance action urban fantasy saga. Welcome to the Thoughts from the Shed podcast. Do you create stories? Learn how to hook your audience and take them on an emotional ride. Not a creator? Learn why the story sucked you in. Or why the story just sucked. Come with me and you'll see a world of pure imagination. Minus children dying horrible deaths in a chocolate factory. A few episodes back, we talked about New Jack City. Link below. I left out one important thing that enhanced the movie. The music. That movie had track after track of great tunes. You had Ice-T's New Jack Hustler as the theme for gangster Nino Brown. The medley that combined the OJ's classic, For the Love of Money, with Stevie Wonder's Living Just Now for the City, yeah, with a Queen Latifah rap in the middle. What? And all of y'all for a particular age know you shook that thing for I want to sex you up. When used wisely, music can make a big difference in your creative works. Which is why I get jealous of musicians, TV shows, and movies who can use music to full effect. We writers can't get music into our works. Or can we? As the great Negro philosopher Barack Obama said, Yes, we can. Well, sort of. Before I tell my fellow writers the tricks to using music, Let's take a look at how movies and TV shows use music to enhance a mood. I'll use examples from the action genre with the Jason Bourne trilogy, and a TV example from the original La Femme Nikita show. But first, I want to discuss the man who wrote the soundtrack to Gen X's movie-going life, John Williams. For all you youngins, John Williams is to Gen X as Hans Zimmer is to you. His music was in every pop culture thing we loved, from Star Wars to Raiders of the Lost Ark to E.T. I could go on, but you get the idea. Williams's music had a gravitas that elevated its subject matter. Back when Christopher Reeve boldly wore the tights, not rubber and latex, but tights, for the first Superman movie, the idea of a comic book character as the focus of a movie was laughable. They had to pull in Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman in an attempt at legitimacy. But then, this happened. How could you not feel a swell of power and righteousness from William Spore? That sense of righteousness puts the audience squarely in the mindset of a hero, just like Superman. Combining the score with Reeves' aw shucks heroism made skeptics believe a man could fly. Williams used a technique called a leitmotif for all his scores. A leitmotif is a short, recurring musical phrase associated with a particular person, place, or idea. It's kind of like a personal theme song. Every important character should have one. The Jason Bourne trilogy, there were not two other movies, did three big things. It made us believe Matt Damon, the Boston frat boy from Goodwill Hunting and Ocean's Eleven, could be an action star. It changed how American action films looked, bringing us the shaky cam and quick edits, for better or for worse. Usually for worse. Looking at you taking sequels. The Bourne movies even influenced the original action hero, Bond, James Bond. He became a darker, grittier hero, as realized by Daniel Craig. Don't believe me? Bourne Identity dropped in 2002, Bourne Supremacy in 2004, Casino Royale started filming in 2006. And aside, though, I'd argue that Timothy Dalton's Bond in The Living Daylights and License to Kill first brought us the darker, grittier Bond. Unfortunately, it was way too much of a shock for audiences coming off the goofball bond that was Roger Moore. 
but I digress. The third big thing the Bourne series brought us is the topic of this episode, the music. Unlike Williams' movies, the Bourne movies didn't have a leap motif, motif per se. It stuck more to the James Bond mode of having a recognizable theme for the hero, but the rest of the music prioritized setting mood over introducing a character. Bourne trilogy composer John Powell actually gave Bourne two themes. First, there's the light floating theme on the bassoon that starts the entire franchise. We get the feel of a man literally floating in the ether, or water in this case, feeling his humanity through the song. The second theme is more direct, a staccato of strings and percussion. It's some music for a man on the move, as Bourne often is. I particularly point you to the Berlin foot chase from this Bourne supremacy. Try listening to that while on a walk or driving. See if you suddenly don't want to move like Jagger. I mean, Jason. The audience feels the exact same way as they watch the movie. For my novelist peeps, there's a way to give readers that same vicarious thrill. But before I reveal that, let's talk about the use of pop music in the La Femme Nikita TV show. La Femme Nikita started life as the French movie Nikita. Written and directed by Luc Besson, a subject for a later episode, Lumps and All, Nikita followed a Parisian street urchin snatched up by a secret organization. They trained her to be an assassin. The movie inspired the television show that aired on USA Network between 1997 and 2001, starring Peter Wilson in the title role. La Femme Nikita had a musical score composed by Sean Cowery. It had all the moody marks of a gritty spy thriller plunging you into Nikita's dark world. Nothing is what it seems, and no good deed goes unpunished. But Nikita mixed things up by borrowing a technique from the 80s action vehicle, Miami Vice. A technique that, unfortunately, the WB and later CW network shows would abuse to a fault. Nikita used pop music to help set the mood. For example, season one ended with Nikita seemingly escaping her life as a secret agent, but having to leave behind the man she loved. The Depeche Mode song, The Love Thieves, became the leitmotif for this moment. The song's fans had already felt the melancholy the song presents. Now match that melancholy with a scene with melancholy. The emotion of that scene locks in your brain. You can't hear that song without thinking of Nikita. Just like Star Wars fans can't help but think of Darth Vader every time they hear Williams' Imperial March. Go ahead, I'll wait. Using pop songs can make art feel hip. Unfortunately, it can also make that art look dated. See Miami Vice and try think of it set at any time besides the 80s, which is why the movie with the Penguin and Electro didn't work. Nikita, however, lives in a netherworld in which the tech dates the show, but the music seems timeless, as it's more about establishing the mood than getting the next hit on the show. Now, I ain't gonna lie. Using pop songs also opens up sales for a soundtrack and helps sell the individual songs. Kinda like me bringing it up will hopefully send you out looking for not only these songs, but the movies, TV shows, and other creative works I talk about. You know, I gotta set up an affiliate site and stop giving away all this free publicity. My dog has to eat. Music can play a major role in enhancing your story. So how can a writer use it? Let's talk to my screenwriter and comic book writer peeps first. A screenplay can have what the industry calls music cues. To set a music cue, put the words music cue in all caps, followed by the name of the song in quotations. Or you can do it how Edgar Wright did for his music intensive movie, Baby Driver. He just wrote in the song and artist and made it organically clear that a song played. You can get away with music cues in a screenplay because nobody pays to read a script. They pay to see the movie that the script becomes. Think of the script as a work in progress. You may not even get the songs you mentioned in the finished movie anyway. There's the cost of licensing. There's the preferences of the eventual filmmakers who may not like your song, just to name two reasons it may not get in. But you're about setting a mood, not selling a song, right? A script for a comic book is like a screenplay in that it's a work in progress. 
Unfortunately, music cues like those in a screenplay won't work. Unlike a movie or TV show, a comic book in its finished form cannot play music. You're left with three options. That old school music bars and notes, writing in song lyrics and hoping people recognize them, or a combination of the two. The music bars thing is kind of hokey, but it works in a pinch. However, there's more about that's more about letting the readers know there's music playing. It hardly sets any kind of mood. Song lyrics are better, but before the publisher sells the finished comic book, somebody has to pay for clearance to use the lyrics. Or you have to write original lyrics. As if keeping track of character motivations, plot points, dialogue wasn't enough for you to do. So, unfortunately, comic book writers are kind of screwed when it comes to using music. It can't be any better for the novelist, can it? You can't use music to set the mood, can you? Yes, we can! Let your Uncle Mark show you how to do it. Make your book an audiobook! Sounds obvious, huh? But a warning. You can't just grab a song and play it in your audiobook. You want people to pay for your work, so do musicians. That costs dollar dollar bills, y'all. And you're already paying for editors, ads, and now the cost of producing an audiobook. There's gotta be a cheaper way, right? I have a trick you can use, but only for my ebook peeps, unfortunately. It could kinda of, sorta of work in a printed book, but it's easier for the reader in the electronic form. It all comes down to one word. Hyperlinks or links for you hotshot internet whizzes. I'd always known your ebook can have hyperlinks. I used them in my first two Shadow Dance books to link readers to character bios. Then I read the book Secura, Intellectual Property by Zachary Hill, Patrick M. Tracy, and Paul Genese. The book is a cyberpunk tale of an android heavy metal inspired pop star caught in the clutches of a corporation that wants to use her as an assassin. It screams for music, and the writing team delivers with references to the songs the pop star Sakura plays or that inspire her. The authors describe in loving detail how Sakura feels when playing the song, mentioning the musical techniques she uses to produce the music. But the authors take it a step further. They put links to YouTube videos of the songs at the start of each chapter. Now the reader can click on the link and listen to the song while they read the book. How's that for setting a mood? And you, my dear novel writers, can do the same. It's as easy as finding the song you want to use on YouTube or any streaming service that allows embedded links and setting the link in your work. You can also build an entire playlist readers can listen to as they read. Build this list on YouTube or whatever streaming music player you favor. I'd stick with the popular ones. You may even want to make the same list on multiple streamers so the reader can choose the one that ads won't interrupt. It would really suck to get in the playlist mood and then hear an ad for a plumbing company. Instead of associating your story with a mood, they associate your story with crap. Now that you're having all sorts of fun with your music, you have to show restraint. What could be a nice periodic touch could quickly become an annoyance. Avoid that by making your music organic to the story. Sure, you want to set a mood, but you also don't want to interrupt their experience with a new link every time the scene changes. Movies and TV have the privilege of an underscore, with many things prevalent for the audience's senses. Your audience is locked to sight only. Dozens of links pulling them away from the written word of your story could force them to put your story down. Don't inundate unless your story, like Sakura, is all about music. Use your song sparingly for maximum impact. The Sakura folks made a special place for links at the beginning of each chapter. I'd recommend that method. You could also pop your playlist in the front matter of your book on a page labeled author's note or something. Explain what the list is and why you have it. Let the reader know they can use it if they like, or they can pass it by. Maybe throw in something about introducing them to new music too. Kind of a hook. Use these methods to develop leitmotifs for your story. Just don't get too attached if the song's creator gets testy. 
which leads us to copyright. Let me preface with, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. You can use song titles in your stories. You cannot play song lyrics in your story. That is copyright infringement. Litigation from a major record label will end you financially before your book sees market. Be the anti-Nike. Just don't do it. Posting links to other people's works is not using their work in your media. Therefore, it's fair game. Not to be confused with fair use, another legal term that doesn't have an application here. When using music in your story, describe how the song sounds, how it makes a character feel, the musical technique used to play the song, if you're savvy enough on that kind of thing or willing to do the research. All of that is legal and more interesting and capable of setting a mood better than just writing lyrics. I hope I've not only showed you the importance music can play in setting mood, but also given you some tricks on how to use music in your stories. I'll have links to the soundtracks I mentioned and the book Secura on this episode's page. Find it over at writermarkwooden.com, which is also, say it with me now, shadowdancesaga.com. I still have the newsletter going, but there's a new way to subscribe. You'll see it on the bottom of every page of the newly redesigned website. I'm still rolling with the Go Nam story, pop culture news, and writer Mark Wooden updates. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at writer Mark Wooden and subscribe on your favorite audio only podcast apps as well. Now get out there and see if you can incorporate some music in your stories. Perhaps when a reader hears a song on your playlist, they'll think of your book, especially if you create a lead motif or theme song for your characters. Leave a comment below and tell us how it works out. See you next time. Subscribe to the YouTube and sign up for the newsletter because I'm Batman and he's writer Mark Wooden. <laughs>